I am here with a very special guest, Jia Jiang. He is an entrepreneur. He's a blogger. He's a TED speaker. Uh, he's an author. And he doesn't know this, but he is a personal role model for me. You'll understand this a little bit better down the road. Let me just plug his, one of his books right here. He wrote this book, Rejection Proof. And I watched his TED Talk. You gave several in like 2015, 2016, around that time, right? Yeah, 20, yeah 2015, yeah. Yeah, and then I got your book. And I was so impressed with it that I uh, started a rejection group with a group of friends wow. and, we, and we started sending each other's on missions to get rejected. And I can tell you more about that. I don't want to spoil anything, but uh, you helped me redefine my relationship with rejection. And I know that there are a lot of people in my audience who really struggle with either a partner who's really sensitive to rejection and feels rejected at, at the turn of every, you know, piece of feedback or criticism, or they themselves are really sensitive to rejection. And I can't think of anybody better on the planet to have on the show come and talk to us about the feelings of rejection and how we can overcome them. So I'm really, really grateful for, for you being willing to come spend some time talking to me about this super important topic. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, Nate. I'm, I'm excited about this. And I usually talk about rejections in more of a business or entrepreneurial sense. But when it comes to relationships, this is pretty new to me, but I love it. I love it. I, I would love to, to see how uh, these principles can apply to relationships and marriages. I think we're going to find a lot of overlap between that business world and the marriage world. So can you start by telling us a little bit about your story? I want you to give some context as to why you're here and how you how because you weren't always interested in rejection. You stumbled upon this topic, becoming the rejection expert in a really interesting way. And I'd love to hear that story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no one <laughs> grew up saying, hey, you ought to be a rejection expert. That just doesn't happen. If there's another person with that uh, that, that career dream, I, I got to know that person. So <laughs> I, I grew up um, wanting to be an entrepreneur. I met Bill Gates at a pretty early age, I migrated to the United States when I was uh, 16 as a culture exchange student, going to high school in America and just fall in love with the country, fall in love with the entrepreneurial spirit. And I said, I want to be the next Bill Gates and I, I want to build this greatest company in the world. So that was when I was uh, 16. Then one day I woke up, I was 30. Um, no, I didn't build the biggest company in the world. And I was like, what's happening? Life is passing me by, you know? and I got married, bought a dog, bought a house, bought a car, got a kid on the way. And I was like, well, oh, I felt old. I felt like I probably missed the boat. I'll be a good family man going forward. Maybe someday my kids might be able to pursue his dreams. So that's where the relationship part came in. My wife, she's been very supportive. She's awesome. Like that's the best thing that ever happened to me. She was like, hey, when I first met you, all you talked about were your business ideas. You want to do this, you want to do that. I, I want to have that guy back, right? If you want to be this entrepreneur, if you want to pursue your dreams, go do it. It's not that complicated. Why don't you just quit your job and build your company? Uh, don't do it forever. Let's do it for like, say, six months. And we'll set up goals like metrics. If by the end of six months, you reach them, you keep going. Otherwise, you can, you can look for a job again. It's not that complicated. Your wife is awesome. Yeah, she really is. You know, I just, I just, there are many times I just, I know I like, like man, I, I married up, you know, I, I, I felt it at that moment. So that's where I started my company. But the thing is not, it's easy to say, oh, to ride that hero's journey. When you start a company, you'll overcome all kinds of issues and, and problems. In the end, you build a successful company, you got an IPO and all that, right? It didn't work out that way. I got rejected with the investment uh, to my company. And the, f the first the first thought that came to me when I got rejected was I got to quit because the person who rejected me, I respected him. He's a, a very well-known investor. He must knew something I didn't, uh, you know, and I should just quit now before I embarrass myself more. Yeah. Then I, you know, so then I talked to my wife that night and I said, hey, maybe I did have my fun. You know, maybe I did give this a try, uh, but it's time to look for a job again. Maybe to get, to get the income flowing a couple of months earlier. That's where my wife is saying, Tracy, her name is Tracy. She was like, hey, I give you six months. I didn't give you four. Just keep going and don't leave any regret. So that's where she was like this, you know, 
quarterback just grabbing the face mask of this offensive lineman after he gave up a sack or something. Right. Just like, hey, you got to do it. Get so, your head back in the game. Yeah, yeah, seriously. And that's where it just dawned on me. Would Bill Gates want to give up after rejection like that? Would anyone successful at anything after getting rejection like that? So I'm going to have to overcome this fear of rejection. I can do better. I can build a better team, better product, but I got to be a better person and leader. So that's where I went on this crazy journey of 100 days of rejection therapy. I found out this game of called rejection therapy basically asks you to go get rejected on purpose. And, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. So I set up to do 100 days. Um, and I want to see if I can overdose on rejection. Overdose <laughs> on rejection. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and if, yeah, I can be this tough guy. And 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 so that's what I did. That's what, that's how I started, became this rejection guy. I, I built a blog. I, I said, I didn't want to just do it. I'm going to use my phone to film myself uh, doing this. And I'll put this on YouTube and make a vlog out of this thing. So that's what I did. That's amazing. So you got this one rejection. You're like, I give up. I don't want to embarrass myself. I'm humiliated. Your wife's like, get back in the game. And you're like, you know what? If I'm going to be successful at this, I need to figure out how to overcome rejection, which means I need to face it more. Yeah. I'm curious, what are some of the things that you did on that journey to overcome your fear of rejection? And what did you learn along the way about yourself? Yeah, I pretty much had a transformation along the way. So I started out asking things like, hey, can I borrow $100 from someone, like just a random person? After having a burger, I said, can I get a burger refill? And one day I went to PetSmart and I said, hey, can I get a haircut here? I'm not a dog, but can I get a haircut? <laughs> so I just did all this kind of a crazy stuff and I was having a great time, but I was getting rejected left and right. But, but the first thing I learned is it wasn't too bad. Like before I started the first try, I thought all kind of terrible things were going to happen to me. Like the person going to cuss me out. You know, he's, maybe he's going to you know, throw stuff at me, maybe pepper spray me. I don't know. This is all type of bad things that are happening in my mind. But when I hear the rejection, right, the, the person said no. And it's almost like the confirmation bias. When I hear a no, I just ran as fast as I could. I said, oh, this is bad. Let, let me run. But the thing is, doing a video blog, you have to experience everything twice because I have to upload the video. I have to see myself, right? Right. That opened up a whole new world to me. Because when I was seeing myself, I'm like, well, this guy said no, but he wasn't mean. Right? He didn't cuss me out. So all those terrible things that were playing in my mind, yes, I got a rejection, but it wasn't that bad. Right. So I'm just like, okay, going forward, I'm going to slow down. I don't just run after rejection because that was like the microcosm of, of my life. Every time I got a rejected, I just, I just feel like confirming all the terrible things I thought about myself. And I just felt I'm terrible. I just leave. Right? So that episode taught me not to leave and stay engaged after rejection. So that's what I did. And the funny thing is once I stay engaged, once I bring back my confidence and say, all right, I'm not going to be so afraid to run. I'm going to just stay engaged. That had a tremendous impact in how the other person's perceiving me, how the interaction was going. Because when I did that, um, I had more confidence and I had more fun. I was smiling more. I was standing up straight. And I was negotiating. And pretty soon, people started to say yes to me, like one after another. For example, I was able to place a soccer in someone's backyard. I was able to drive a police car. Yeah, you just knocked on somebody's door and you're like, can I play soccer in your backyard? Yeah. And they're like, okay. Yeah. Basically, yeah, he was like, come on in. I was like, what? I didn't, how do I play soccer in my, with myself in the backyard? I didn't think that part through. Again, again, this happened. Like after... 100 days, I got 51 yes and 49 no. Probably the most famous one is where I went to a Krispy Kreme donut shop and asked them to make me donuts that look like Olympic rings. Yeah. And when I did that, it was I, there's no way she's going to say yes, right? I was just come in and make a joke and leave. But actually, she did. She took me so seriously. And 30 minutes later, there's a box of donuts that look like Olympic rings. It was amazing. So it really just taught me, hey, if you just don't run after rejection, you don't have to have this confirming all those terrible thoughts you have. There's a whole new world out there if you just don't run. I, I love this story because there's so many lessons embedded in rejection. And sometimes we're so afraid or so resistant to the, the feelings or the stories that we've created in our head that aren't even true, that we never hang around enough to figure out what's actually going on and why we're getting rejected. 
So I want to rewind just a little bit and see if you can explain about the psychology of why we fear rejection so much as human beings. Why is it so scary for us? Why do we have so many fears and so much resistance to being rejected, even around small things? Based on research, it's likely in our DNA. You know, probably our ancestors, when they were hunters and gatherers, and, you know, we do well. We're, think about it, we're the top of the food chain. But we're not that fast or we're not that strong, but we, we collaborated better than anyone. We're very smart, but, but we're collaborators. But the thing is, if you're hunting, um, if you're not collaborating, if you're just going out there and trying to be a cowboy, you know, on my own, right? I'm going to face all the beasts. Very quickly, the hunter becomes a hunted. You cannot survive in that type of environment unless you are accepted and liked by everyone. That very likely played into our needs to be liked, to be accepted, because that way we feel safe. However, in modern world, that probably doesn't work. I mean, it's not it doesn't work. We're still need to collaborate. But when we think about innovation, when we think about doing things that most people wouldn't dare to do, we're thinking about entrepreneurship. Like, for example, Nate, you're starting this podcast. There's going to be likelihood, high likelihood you're going to get rejected by all kinds of people, like yep. you know, any businesses. If you still let that fear of rejection dictate what you do, you're not going to succeed in modern world. So that's why we have a little bit of baggage of this ancient, um, you know, everyone get along kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. If I, can, if I can tie this in a little bit more to, to marriage, one of the, the biggest fears that we have is being rejected by the person who we thought accepted us for exactly who we are. You mm -hmm. know, if there's one person in the world who's supposed to love you and accept you for exactly who you are, you hope it's the person that you chose to be with your partner. You know, I think there's an inherent fear in your partner rejecting you. There might be a story of there's something wrong with me. That fear of being abandoned, that fear of being alone, that fear of this person is the person who committed to spend the rest of their life with me and love me through the good times and the bad. If they're rejecting me now, does that mean that I'm going to be alone? Is there, is, am, am I broken? Am I not worthy of love? And all of these irrational fears start to cook up in our brain. And that can be a really scary thing. So I love that you talked about safety because safety is a huge part of having a successful relationship. And that safety comes from the way we treat each other, but it also comes with being able to control the irrational stories that go on in our heads. If we're constantly telling ourselves that something terrible is going to happen and it's an unrealistic story that we're telling ourselves, we're not helping ourselves feel safe. So there's an element of personal responsibility in helping your partner feel safe and helping yourself feel safe in that relationship. Yeah, I feel that that's really a self of self-fulfilling prophecy. If you feel that way, you act that way, right? And, oh, yeah. and, and a lot of times when it comes to rejection, we think it's a binary. <clears throat> you either love me, accept me wholeheartedly without any conditions, or you have rejected me as a person. Right. It doesn't work that way, right? In business communication, we can come up with a deal, we can negotiate, or we can be like, hey, I like this part of the deal. Can we... Do the part I like and not do the part I don't like. Oh, that doesn't work. How about let's do a little give and take. How about you get something you want, I give something I, I want. In the end, we come with a business deal, right? And just because the person didn't like this part of the deal doesn't mean that person's hating on you. Doesn't right. mean that you're he's rejecting you or doesn't trust you. No, when it comes to relationship, that conversation is so hard. It's almost like oh, unless anything I do, everything I say is wholly accepted without any sort of argument. Otherwise, that means, wait, why didn't you love me? Why didn't you accept me? A lot of times we have to take our self-worth out of those type of negotiations or communications. And that way we can be more open, be more straightforward talking about things at hand. That's a much healthier communication than say, that. you know, just a screaming match. So stop taking rejection so personal. Yeah, I, I love that. Take the personal part out of the rejection. I'm curious because I think a lot of people, when they feel rejected, they also feel like they're a failure. Can we talk a little bit about the difference between rejection and failure? Yeah, absolutely. They're like cousins. People talk about failure a lot. I live in Silicon Valley. Everyone here is like fail up, right? Fail fail fail. Success. Yeah. yeah. When you talk about failure, it's very, it could be impersonal. It could be like, hey, this thing failed. Cool. You know, I'm going to move on to the next. Or this thing failed because this thing failed. I didn't fail. This thing failed. People come up with all kinds of reasons, right? There's a, maybe the economy isn't right. Maybe there's a, you can't find product market fit. 
Maybe you're ahead of your time, right? Maybe the execution wasn't right. So here in Silicon Valley, we can come all kinds of terms to describe failure where you don't feel like you're a failure, right? Right. When it comes to rejection though, man, you got rejected. You, right. like you are now, a failure. Yeah, you, not your business. You got rejected. You present your idea. You pitched your idea. When it comes to relationship, when you get rejected, man, you feel like I'm not presenting a app here. I'm presenting myself to be your partner and I get rejected. So people take that so personally. That's why you see uh, like a million books talking about failure. It's fun to talk about failure even. There used to be a conference called the FailCon here in San Francisco yeah. for years, but there is no rejection con. Maybe I should start one. Uh, you know, sure. when it comes to rejection, yeah. people take it way more seriously because that's about you. So when it comes to relationship, that's why people take it so personal because you don't have an excuse, right? It's not like, hey, she didn't like my car. That's why the relationship didn't work. No, it's not yeah. like that. She didn't like you. Right. <laughs> so, but there's a long way before the relationship didn't work to say, I mean, maybe there's something you should be worked out before she will reject you. So don't you quit like a little bit of argument, a little bit of, of a thing, or even part of you, maybe they're part of it. Maybe she likes everything about you, but maybe they're part of it. like, Hey, you snore too much or whatever. Right. Hey, work it out, work it out. People are malleable. Like well, that's why this having this growth mindset is so important in marriage or relationship as well. Right. The title of this podcast is The Growth Marriage, because that's what we believe in here is having that growth mindset. So let's get a little bit more specific now. Let's pretend there's a couple and whenever the words, hey, can we talk, come up, one of the partners just goes, oh, and wants yeah. to like keel over and die because anytime they get some feedback or criticism, they feel completely rejected and overwhelmed. And their first instinct is, I'm not good enough. I'm a failure. If I avoid this or stay away from it or maybe escalate or distract, I, I want to do anything but confront this thing that my partner is trying to put in front of me. What are some things uh, that both partners could do to approach that rejection in a more productive way? First of all, the uh, can we talk, right? There are two layers of this. One is the words, can we talk? Another is what's happening after the talk, right? The yeah. word itself there's nothing wrong. Can we talk? Actually, you should be talking all the time. You should be communicating every day and let what other person know how you feel. But what's end up happening is the second layer is criticism, right? Like something that doesn't work. I get you're like, hey, can you can you fix this or or hey, it's not working out. So that's why it's almost like a like the dog experiment, right? If you put a ding sound and give the dog food, the dog associate the sound with the food. If if you associate the word, can we talk with a nasty argument that come with it? Of course, it's going to be a triggering word. I say we should be talking all the time. So we should be talking when things are good, right? Not just like, hey, something is wrong. How about, can we talk? Cool. What's the good thing, right? We had an amazing week. That was a great walk we did. Oh man, that date was awesome. Hey, I really like how you complimented me the other day. Wow. The other day I was really tired after dinner, you stepped up and did more work than you, know, than you usually did. And I really appreciate that. What if we can associate those with the word, can we talk? Then you'll be like, can we talk? Yes. I've been waiting to talk for a long time. I need more praise, right? So when you talk more positively, you know, the, assume positivity. And then when something's bad, you mention. That's one thing. A second thing is, I, I, I want to talk to my wife. We've set up some sort of cadence. That we talk every week. In fact, we talk every day. After dinner, we take a walk. We talk about all kinds of things, but also we set up a, a cadence every week. We sit down or we're, we're like, Hey, what has went well? What can we do better? And what about the kids? And what about my parents? My parents are staying with me during the pandemics. So we talk about all kinds of things. And when we do it, we do it in a very fun way. I try to, you know, I try to come up with all kinds of different ways. One day I try to do a presentation you know, I try to do PowerPoints. Another day I was like, here's a spreadsheet and here's the pie chart. I do all kinds of fun ways. So communication yeah. is actually really the key in relationships. And I found that what's bad for a lot of relationships is you only communicate when things are bad, not when yeah. things are good. I love that advice. And I think that cri criticism's twin brother is defensiveness. Mm -hmm. And when you're anticipating criticism, your instinct is always going to be to put up your dukes and get ready for a fight and get defensive. 
And so uh, oftentimes I think when somebody f- is really sensitive to rejection, they're a highly defensive person. Dr. John Gottman says there's kind of two types of defensiveness. One is called cross complaining where it always starts with, yeah, well, what about, you know, mm-hmm. they'll be like, well, you didn't help me with the dishes last night. And you said you would, well, yeah, well, what about the time that you didn't help me with the dishes? And it's like, yeah. that's one way of getting defensive. And then another way of uh, being defensive is the innocent victim. And the innocent victim curls up into a little ball and goes, it's always my fault. You're right. I'm just a failure. I'm just a bad husband. I'm just a terrible wife. <laughs> like I, you know, and, and that's another way of getting defensive is, is playing this innocent victim who's just always the cause of everything bad. And those are kind of the two things that people who are super sensitive to rejection in a relationship oftentimes revert to. And so being able to condition your partner to not anticipate the rejection, their likelihood to slip into defensiveness is going to drop. And they'll welcome those conversations a lot more if we can have more positive conversations around gratitude and praise. Absolutely. Those two traits you mentioned happens almost in every marriage, maybe it does, or every relationship. It doesn't like happen all the time. But the good thing about this is, I mean, two parts. One is you have to communicate. Sometimes when you are having a good time, right, when you're having a great time, that's where you should mention, like, say, hey, and also don't start with the other person. Hey, you should work on this, uh, right. your innocent victimness. Like, don't do that. We're like, hey, how can we communicate better, right? Here's what's something I can do better. How about we can help each other do this? So, it, like, like, the thing you're doing, you kind of uh, bring that out, right? The, the, you, you, you categorize those behaviors. You're like, hey, that's actually pretty normal. It happens to a lot of people. How about we don't, we both not fall victim to that trait right and then during good time you can talk about it in a very um you know you, you can you know, categorize it in that way what i learned from rejection therapy is you take issues out of your person you talk right even if that's your issue even you like to play like an innocent victim all the time you don't have to be like that's who you are you are an innocent victim you're you talk about this hey there's a communication issue or trait people use is called innocent you know, victimhood right? Uh, we Maybe we both fall part of it. How about we take this out of our relationship? So you put that as a third person rather than say you or me, right? right. That's one thing. Another thing is you just need to praise each other more. All couples need to praise each other more. Like if you build each other up, if you feel like, like tons of praise are throwing left and right and, and sincerity, sometimes a little bit of suggestions or criticisms it's doable. It's takeable because you know there's a lot that there are a lot of that emotional buildup, uh, in uh, the positive buildup. So if there's a little bit of some cushion, even there's some sort of a uh, you know um, unpleasantness, hey, you know what you can take it. Yeah, we call it the emotional bank account. Yes, you make lots of deposits in the emotional bank account, and then you have yeah. if you can make a withdrawal every now and then. But if you're never yeah. making deposits, and you're always overdrawing your account of compliments, you're you're going to be in big trouble. Yeah. Exactly. Um, another thing that I see a, a lot with couples is uh, this is a very stereotypical example, but I'm just going to use it anyway. Mm-hmm. Husband wants more sex. So he tries to initiate and his wife goes, I'm too tired. I'm not feeling good. I have a headache. And he goes, Ooh, and he, he kind of pouts and sulks and kind of punishes her for rejecting him. I mean, there's tons of examples like this, whether it's you want to go on a vacation or maybe you want to move to a new city or maybe you want to go on a fancy date and your partner says no in some way and and you shut down and withdraw and get the silent treatment. What are some alternatives to that? Somebody who's doing the withdrawing, instead of pouting and sulking and punishing your partner, what are some better alternatives to deal with that rejection that might be more productive? Yeah. One thing about rejection therapy I I learned is it's mostly not about you. You know, rejection way more about the other person than you. Because, okay, where are the centers of our own universe? Where are the heroes, our own journeys? That's where everything felt like about us, right? That's why every rejection felt like indictment for us. Every acceptance felt like a confirmation of our merit. It's just not. Rejection says more about the other person. Like, so in the hundred days of rejection, I could go talk to 10 different people. Someone will say yes. Someone will say no. Someone will smile. Someone will just try to get away from me faster. Right. So it doesn't say about me. I'm the same person making the same request. I will get 10 different reactions. Why is that? Because that person, something might happen to him or her the night before, 
or maybe it's a lifelong of understanding needs, prejudice, who knows, right? It, but it's not just about us. When it comes to relationships, the same thing. You know, when the per other person is tired, it doesn't mean, wow, she's not sexually attracted to me. We very easily, we can turn those things all about us, right? And so what we should do is like, hey, you know, how can I help you? Man, why is this happening? Are you tired? How about we try to find times where you're not tired? How about we change up the time? Instead of ask about sex at the end of the day, you know, when you just took care of the kids and everything, and I'll be tired too, right? How about we try to do some tricks? Let's how about we do it in the morning? Maybe how about, I don't know, you try to find ways when you're not tired, right? I'll take a long so, lunch. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Have a long lunch and with uh, some nice coffee. And then, hey, how, off we go. So there are all kinds of ways where if you just take that out of your self-worth and think it's all about you, right? And then you can figure out ways to make it happen. Because in the end, most people like sex. Most people like vacations, right? Just yeah. because you got rejected this time, actually, something's going on with her. Like, she's tired, right? So, you know, figure out a way instead of yeah. trying to trying to one-up each other. In my house, we just went through something like this where my wife is like, I need a vacation. I need to get away somewhere. Uh, can, can we plan something? And I was like, I mean, I would love to get away too, but I just have a lot of things. Like I have deadlines coming up and I have things that I need to work on. And she started to feel a little rejected and I saw it and I was like, no, this has nothing to do with me not wanting to go on vacation, but I just don't have the bandwidth to plan right now. If you can take the lead on planning, I'm, I'm ready to jump on board. And she's like, oh, cool. And so we had a little negotiation and yeah. she was able to come up with a couple different dates and a couple different locations. And now we're trying to see if we can get something on the radar where we can get out of the house a little bit, somewhere nice and safe and maybe a little warmer than the mountains of Utah. So it's funny you mentioned that. So in the 100 Days of Rejection Therapy I did, one thing I found is when you got rejected, when you hear the word no, don't just go into that mode of defensiveness or what I call fight or flight, right? Uh -huh. You fight, you're like, man, you're bad. You know, what's going on? The, the flight is like, you just shut down. You just leave. There's a lot of things that can come after that. Like what you did there is like you asked, you made a compromise. You asked for something else. Right. In this, for, like one of these hundred days, I, I went to a hotel uh, in Austin. I asked them, can I get a free night here? And she said, no. Right. And then, you know, I mean, the front desk lady said, no. And I said, hey, can I take a nap in one of your rooms? I'm going to try it out your mattress. She said, sure. So she sent the bellman with me. as I took a nap in one of, one of their under mattresses. That's amazing. But, because, but the thing is, I got a yes because I asked for something big. I got, I got rejected. I didn't just right away give up. I said, right. hey get something else how about this so when i'm showing i'm compromising usually the other person want to return in kind right yeah. and so in this way she asked for something and instead of just saying it's either this or that you plan the whole thing or nothing but you find a compromise yeah. so there's always some back to fall back on so in this case maybe she could ask this to say hey how can i how, 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 how can i do this how right? do we make this happen yeah yeah um so, your hotel example reminded me of another story that I've heard you share. I can't remember if it was in your book or in a talk, but you went to somebody's house and asked if you could plant a fl flower in their backyard or something. Yeah. yeah. I, I, when, when talk, I want to plant some, a flower in some backyard, uh, someone's backyard, the garden, the garden door, he said no, right? But instead of leaving, I just asked him why. He's like, you know, I got a dog and I, I, I can't let people in or the dog would dig up things and put in the backyard. But hey, what you're doing is really cool. Is this some sort of a making people happy thing? If you want to do this, why don't you go talk to Connie across the street? She's my neighbor. She loves flowers. I got so excited because I just got a referral. You know, and yeah. so I went across the street and knocked on Connie's door. And then I planted this flower in Connie's backyard. Well, the, the, the thing about this story is if I just left, if I just didn't ask why, if I just like heard the word no and just left, fight or flight, I would have thought he didn't like me. He didn't trust me. I didn't dress up well. Maybe I didn't speak clearly. Was that my English? Like I could have thought, come up with all kinds of crazy reasons, right? right? And maybe there's some even reasonable assumptions, but they were all wrong. The guy liked me enough to offer me that referral because I stay calm and try to figure out why. So a lot of times, you know, just don't take rejection, let's say, on the surface. There are some deeper reasons sometimes. Right. Some the other person might not 
tell you why right away. You got to do a little bit of digging. So yeah. it pays to actually stay engaged after rejection and don't take it personally that. and find out why. So if there's if there's one big piece of advice that I would have for people after listening to you talk about this stuff, it's when you feel rejected and you feel that desire that you start to get pulled into the fight or flight, I'm going to either shut down or I'm going to attack my partner and tell them all the reasons why they're being a jerk or why they're hurting our relationship and being unrealistic or unreasonable or whatever. Like take a deep breath, stay in it, ask why, get curious, don't just run away there's a lot more to be understood and most likely the story you're making up in your head is exaggerated and untrue. And yeah. if you're willing to stay in the conversation, oftentimes you can find different solutions. You'll find that the story you have in your head about you being rejected is often untrue or at least not fully true. And you'll be able to reach an awesome compromise. Yeah. Ask for compromise. Ask for things like, hey, if you can do this, can you do that? Right. That's a very natural thing to do if you don't get angry. The problem with relationship is like in, in a business transaction, we're like repeat customers. You have a relationship with a client or with a supplier for a long, long time. Right. You have to do this over and over again. After a while, you start annoying each other because, I mean, what happened in the past might start to build up because, for example, someone rejected you, like I say, in a business relationship. Right. Yeah. Next time you do it, or maybe you know, maybe you get accepted the third time, but that first interaction did not go away. You started to start to pull the memory from your past, right? You start to be like, oh, is that because of this? Is that because the, in the first meeting I said this? Maybe the guy didn't like me. In a relationship, it just builds up constantly, especially as emotional. You remember what happened last week or a couple months ago. This time you had a little bit of a rejection or whatever, maybe a little argument. You started pulling those things back. But the thing is, we should treat each conversation as independent. We shouldn't assume things. Ask why. Try to dig deeper. Stop, stop assuming it's because of the reason that something happened four months ago. Yeah. And I see this is so important that you're talking about this because one of the biggest problems I see with couples is something happens in the relationship and somebody feels rejected and they retreat, they pout, they punish their partner, and they never talk about it. And then the behavior becomes the norm. Maybe their partner used a condescending tone of voice, or maybe their partner has stopped kissing them as much as they used to, or holding their hands, giving them as much physical affection, or maybe they're not going on date nights anymore. And then the more they pout or the more they withdraw, or the more that they try and punish their partner for doing those things that are inappropriate, the less their partner wants to kiss them and spend time with them and ask them on dates and romance them. And yeah. it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy. A couple of things that most of the most fulfilled couples are good at are forgiving, forgetting, letting the past be the past, giving each other a fresh start, and then being able to stay curious and really try and understand where your partner's coming from. And if something is happening outside the norm, addressing it now, instead of letting negative habits build up over six months or a year or a decade, and then going, how did this happen? How did we drift apart? How did we become enemies instead of lovers? Because this, this isn't how it used to be, but somewhere along the line, we didn't address a problem and that problem drove a wedge between us and now we're in trouble. Yeah, yeah. It's important to really address the issue and have communication open. Yeah. Like sometimes when you have arguments, right, you're just after a few minutes in, you already forgot what we were arguing about. You started just focusing on the words that just came out of your mouth. How can you say that? Right. And you started trying to get back and then she's like, what, what, you know, then it just escalates into something that's like, you know, you already forgot what you were ar arguing about. It's all about what just happened. So it's important to step back and address the original issue and not do it personally. Again, take problems, take these issues out of people, you know, yeah. and, and, and get together and look at the problem from the third person perspective. I you know, um, you know, it's yeah. So, you know, what one thing that, that, I, that, that I learned in 100 Days of Rejection is you can ask word how. The word how is important. One day I, I, I got a big request and I got rejected and I said, how and how, how can we do this? And right away, the other person changed his behavior. He was like, how can you do this? So we started getting on the same side, looking at problems, like doing problem solving. How can we do this? That's a much better way to handle things. Yeah. Instead of me versus you, it's me and you versus the world. Yes. Or versus the problem. Yes. And you take, you take a team approach. I love that. So much of what you're saying is like, it's just backed up by relationship science. 
there's tons of research that, that backs up all these things that you're saying. And I love that you have come at it from a completely different perspective. So if, I know there's going to be people who listen to this who go, okay, Ja, I need to overcome my fear of rejection. I need to build up some resilience. I need to be able to stare rejection in the face. Is there somewhere they can go where they can practice? Because I think the, the most reactive place that you're going to be is going to be inside your relationship. Yeah. And so I, I would recommend people practice confronting rejection outside their relationship first before you start doing it inside. So is there a place people can go where they can start practicing? Yeah, well, we're in the pandemic, so that's not great. But in a normal situation, maybe when you hear this, everything will be awesome already. Fingers crossed. Uh, yeah, fingers crossed. Go talk to people on the street. You know, the next time you're buying ice cream, go into a grocery store. Uh, when you go to Starbucks, ask for something. Say, hey, can I can I get an extra napkin? Can I get a uh, a cup filled with uh, ice? If you are really afraid of rejection, if you're just like, you know, play by the rule kind of guy, start small. Ask for something yeah. extra and on the street. Hey, can I can we high five? Right. Just do a little bit of thing. You might get rejected. But the thing is, it's okay, you know, and, and you know, do it again and again. Like, and but you can start building up. And the trick about rejection therapy is it gives you a perspective that you just didn't have. You just we feel like somehow the world operates in one way, right? But there are so many things that the world is pretty random, in fact. Um, um there are it's the same person, you tell that person two different things, like be, you behave a little bit differently, you can get a completely different reaction. Yeah. Or you ask the same person the, the same question twice, that person may give you a different reaction. So by having that type of perspective, you know, like the world is dynamic. You can have some influence over it. It's not just like a rigid thing that reacts a certain way when you push a button. Have fun with different ways to communicate. So when you have that perspective, then it's, then it's easier to take that into your relationship. You're like, hey, how about we try this? Hmm, how about I say this? Oh, it didn't work. Okay. That didn't mean I'm a failure. Didn't mean that we're going we're gonna to fall apart. How about I try something else? How about I ask you what you want? How about we sit together and talk about this together? There are so many different things you can do once you gain that perspective. Yes, I love that. Take a collaborative approach, stay curious, start small. I remember, and I, I can loop this in because I talked about it at the very beginning. Um, after reading your book and watching your talks, I got together with a group of friends. There was like four or five of us on a group text. And we started a rejection group because we realized we were stuck, all of us in different areas of our life. And we started sending each other on like daily rejection missions. Yes. And I remember how scary it was, how terrifying it felt. There was one where we all had to go to a restaurant. You might've started this one. I might've stolen this one from you, but ask for the good guy discount. <laughs> yeah. you, was that, did you, did you come up with that? Or did so? I, I can't remember, but. I, I, I did that. Can I, can I get a So we all went in and I was surprised at how many of us got 10% off our meal or 15% off of our meal or a free dessert. I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And then I was single at the time. And I remember I'd be with a buddy and he'd be like, okay, rejection therapy, go talk to that girl. And I'd be like, oh, and there's one in particular that just mortified me. I was in Las Vegas at the time and I was walking through a casino and uh, I told my friends where I was at and they said, okay, you need to walk up to somebody at the slot machine. I need to ask them if you can pull the handle for them. Oh, and if you know, people in Vegas who are on the slot machines, like they get into a rhythm, they're very superstitious. And I paced back and forth in that pit for, I don't know, almost a solid hour, sick to my stomach until I finally dared walk up to a guy and be like, Hey, can, can I, can I pull that? And he's like, yeah, man, go ahead. And I pulled it and I walked away and I was like sweating. And, but, but I, I, I realized I had fabricated so many scary things in my head. And so I, I love this idea. I love the idea of even maybe partnering up with your partner and saying, I realize that I have an aversion to rejection. So can we do rejection therapy together where we both go out and face rejection head on and, and we can send each other on missions. And so it's not you facing your partner rejecting you, but it's you and your partner facing rejection in the world. That'd be like a, it could be a cool, fun thing to do to together as a couple. That, that is so awesome you did that. Like, that's yeah. so awesome. Like, the, the pulling the slot machine, that's really cool. Uh, it's funny that when you mentioned this, like, that was a lot of assumptions being made. People getting the rhythm, doing this. You don't know that. You're, you're just coming up with a reason yeah. not to do it, right? It's like, yeah. I'm in the rhythm here. They're not shooting free throws. They're not, <laughs> doing, they're not doing ballet. They're just running this, right? 
Okay, so things like this, what happens again and again that we come up with reasons that we shouldn't do this, that those reasons are not even real, you know, yeah. but I'm so glad you did it. And you can do this with your, with your partner. Like a fun game is like you, you and your partner in a, in a marriage or in a relationship, you sit down and say, hey, how about you, we, we challenge each other? Maybe next time we have an argument, how about we try this? Yeah. So if you talk about those things on the side and you, when you start doing challenges, you can have a lot of fun with that. I love that, man. Brilliant. So before we move on to anything else, I want to know if you have anything to say about rejection therapy before we take the next step and tell people about what you're working on now. No, I mean, just the world is so dynamic. There's a lot of fun out there. There are a lot of opportunities out there. If you just don't let fear be the first thing in your mind, don't let the terrible things you have in your mind to be the first reaction you have. Go beyond that. Be a little bit uncomfortable at the time. Just a little yeah. bit. You get this whole new world out there. Feel the fear and do it anyway. Yeah. It's a great way to develop courage and resilience. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So now I know you've got a couple other projects you're working on. I know you're tracking your New Year's resolutions. Yes. Yeah. I looked at your spreadsheet this week. and oh, uh, no. <laughs> yeah. I'm on a roll right now, but I'm coming back. Yeah. That's so. all right. I, I, I'm going to send you some encouragement. Okay. All right. Give you a boost. But what else do you have going on that uh, might be of interest to everybody listening right now? So uh, my new year had two projects. One is, as you mentioned, I'm trying to crack the new year resolution. I use a spreadsheet and try to have all the input goals rather than output goals. Uh -huh. Instead of saying making money, instead of saying, you know, I want to be a better dad. I'm like, I'm going to spend a thousand hours doing creative writing this year. I'm going to spend like 500 hours with my kids this year. So I have all these goals where I track every day. So I know by the end of the year, if I meet those goals, I would be uh, very successful and I don't yeah. track the outcome will be great. So I'm trying to crack new year resolutions. Um, the other project I have is a passion project of mine. It's called a love investor. Um, so that sounds right up my alley. Yeah. <laughs> really loving it. So let's hear about it. Love investor. So basically it's my investing philosophy and I've been just hiding it. I've been like, you know, this is my philosophy. And there are a lot of people who are talking about investing in stock market and why am I to talk about this? And then for the past like five years, I learned how many people need this. A lot of people have no idea how to invest their money. They either put this in a checking account or a money market account, or they treat stock market like the Wall Street bet people, just like a giant slot machine to see if you can come up on top. But I discovered a way where you can align your, your loves, like what you love in the world, the companies you love with your investment. And it has served me really well for the past 10 years. You know, I, I, I was able to beat uh, the S&P 500 2.5 times when it comes to returns, which is pretty insane. I'm not some sort of hedge fund. I don't have a lot of math background, even though it's hard to believe, I know. But right. what, what I focused on is how to align what you like, what are the companies that you love, whose product and services that you cannot live with? Oh man, you're going to have emotional involvement with those companies, invest in those companies. Usually if you love those companies, there are millions of other people love those companies and the company whose product and services are attracted to people like you, there's a number one indication that it's a great investment. So that's what I'm teaching right now. It's called a love investor. If you're interested, go to rejectiontherapy.com. You can find that section called Love Investor. Dude, I'm grateful that you went on this journey because not only what I've been able to learn from you and what you were able to learn for yourself about rejection and about persevering and um, getting curious and staying present and not going into fight or flight, not only has that helped tons of people, but I think it's also opened the door for these other projects for you to work on. I think it's cool to think about that. I don't know if you'd be working on this love investor project if it hadn't been for the rejection therapy stuff. And it's cool how one chapter of your life, if you approach it the right way, can open the door for other really cool projects and other cool chapters. So, yeah, what, what taught me is stop worrying about what other people like. I mean, do worry about it, but right. start with what you love. Right. Start, start with your problem, start with your journey. And if people resonate, people will follow. So have fun, like, you know, whatever you're doing, I'm sure you're having a lot of fun with, uh, with this podcast, but whatever your adventure you're doing, you gotta have fun, right? Yeah. If you feel like you're just grinding and trying to push through the bad part, so maybe someday the good part might come, the good part will never come. 
Never you gotta enjoy you. this journey. You gotta enjoy this, this, uh, this doing this. Then the good part might come. Well, dude, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your story. My hope is that it, I know it's going to inspire some people to approach things a little bit differently. And maybe, maybe we'll even start in our little group, a little rejection therapy challenge and uh, see if we can get people to be a little bit more resilient. So awesome. Thanks for what you do, man. And thank you for your time. Appreciate you.